I'm Alex Guns, the manager of the Heptagon Future Trends Equity Fund, and I'm here today to talk about the pet economy. What exactly is the pet economy? The pet economy is basically all about the well-being of companion animals. Think about it like this. Animals, in some ways, share many traits which are similar to humans, but at the same time are very clearly quite distinct. So we're, when we're talking about the pet economy, we're talking about the health, wellness, and dietary needs of pets. Uh, to our mind, it's a huge opportunity. It's a very large market too. Think about it uh, in the following fashion. Globally, you'll see that pet ownership in most geographies, certainly most developed markets around the world, is actually pretty high. Close on about 40% of households on average will have a dog and about 30% of households will have a cat. And those figures are remarkably consistent across most large economies. When you do the numbers then, you'll see that the pet economy today is worth over $200 billion in size. The market's consistently and historically grown at an above average level of GDP and our expectations, consistent with those of our external forecasters, is that the market should continue to grow at this rate going forward. So what prompted you to do the work on this particular future trend? In terms of what prompted us to do the work on the pet economy, I would say there are probably three factors at work, two serious and one slightly more trivial. In terms of the first serious factor, as we talked about, it's a very large market, the pet economy. Uh, we're attracted to it owing to its uh, predictable revenue streams. Most animals will live for a decade plus. Um, there's a limited lack of, uh, there's a limited amount of seasonality within the pet economy. And as we'll talk about later on in this conversation, there's a lot of scope to both premiumize and digitalize the pet economy. That takes us quite nicely onto the second reason that attracted us to doing the work on this, which is, that follow, which is as follows. Uh, listeners may recall that earlier on in 2021, we did quite extensive work on telemedicine, which we discussed in another video format like this. We basically concluded that telemedicine was very attractive, owing basically to the decentralization thesis that you're taking out the middleman, you're making the transaction or interaction between a doctor and a patient much more efficient than it was previously. Our thinking then went on as follows, that basically if you have this relationship or you can have this digital relationship between a doctor and a patient, why can't you have it between a vet and an animal? And we started looking at adjacencies within that space. The third and final reason why we started thinking much more actively about this theme is that I, uh, similar to many other people during the uh, period of lockdown, um, our household became owners of a dog for the first time. And just simply that experience, uh, the highs and the lows of pet ownership, although I'd add there have been substantially more highs than lows, and the uh, amount of income spent on our pet uh, really got me thinking about why this would be a potentially interesting opportunity to uh, research further. So the pandemic has clearly played a big part. What are the key factors that are driving the growth of the pet economy? Well, there are multiple drivers of growth for the pet economy. But to um, return to the point about the pandemic, at the core of this is a really interesting observation. When you actually think about it, what is the motivation for getting a pet? And the simplest answer to that question is companionship. Uh, certainly, if you look at demographic data, you will see that with more and more single households, uh, both in developed and developing nations, uh, the idea of actually having a pet as a companion or almost as a child substitute is actually quite compelling. Then you go on to ask the question, what is it that companionship offers? And certainly when you look at all of the, uh, the studies, you will actually see that having a pet is very positively correlated with improving well-being, uh, reducing anxiety, reducing depression, clearly providing company. And these factors, I think, were only exacerbated during the, uh, during the pandemic and the lockdown period. I think there are two other really important observations which follow from this. Number one is that if we really believe that pets are our companions, they're going to be with us for a long period of time, then the logic would follow that we want to spend more money on them. And what we're actually seeing is that, um, is that pet owners are indeed doing this. And you're seeing not only a premiumization of something very basic like food. Historically, people would buy uh, perhaps supermarket owned brand food, a very generic, uh, well-known brand. Whereas now this is actually shifting to, say, organic pet food, 
pet food that's tailored much more towards specific pets. The, the thing that then um, occurs is the next stage almost of pet ownership, if you will, is uh, where you actually start going into almost more discretionary or frivolous areas. Um, to call out an example, uh, we were intrigued to read about how the uh, Hilton Hotel chain uh, now actually uh, encourages owners to bring pets to some of their hotels. They have a dedicated pet menu now called uh, Bon Appetit. Uh, it's offering the likes of Beef Dauguignon or Earl Greyhound Tea. And it's a really good example to our mind of premiumization. The final thing I'd call out is that just as we humans uh, lead our lives increasingly digitally, so you see this driver within the pet economy as well. Many owners think, look, we care about our pets, we care about pet safety. So monitoring, whether that's GPS tracking devices, security cameras in the house, that's becoming a, a significant segment of the market. And then even just to call out one final example, even if you're thinking about the comfort of your pet, perhaps say when uh, you, the owner, are absent at work in an office as the world returns to normal, uh, Dog TV was something launched in America, dedicated programming for dogs. Uh, I will, uh, in the interest of full disclosure, say that we haven't started a subscription yet, but uh, I think that certainly uh, all listeners of this piece should expect to see more services like this emerging. So what benefit does dig digitalization bring to pet economy stakeholders? Well, I think the benefits of digitalization, uh, when you're looking at the stakeholders of the pet economy, are very, very similar to those we'd characterize for the real economy. So digitalization is effectively all about increasing and improving efficiency. It's reducing friction for owners. It's, a, it, it's all about improving better outcomes. If I may give a couple of examples or case studies, at the simplest, think about the, the speed and convenience of transacting online relative to actually physically going to a store, particularly if it's a bulky item like a 10 kilo bag of pet food, actually clicking on, on your computer or your mobile, having it delivered to your door within 24 hours is a massive efficiency gain. And not all of the, uh, the obvious retail uh, functions uh, have yet been digitalized. The other really, really important area as we talked about as healthcare. We started doing our work um, originally uh, with that background of telemedicine in mind. And you think about the premise for digital in general when you're applying it to healthcare. And it's all about effectively shifting the paradigm. Historically, healthcare was reactive. You went to your doctor or your vet with a problem. Uh, the doctor or the vet solved it. Now the, the, the tables have turned and it's almost preemptive. Something like DNA sequencing is important for breeding but it can also help preempt potential problems down the line. And then think about telemedicine or televet services. Uh, it often can be quite a stressful experience having to put a vet in a, in a cage of some sort, putting the pet in the, uh, in the car and then transporting it to the vet. If all of this can be done in an, in an efficient online setting, it's a really great uh, benefit for all stakeholders. One final example, we, we've talked quite a lot when we think about future trends about the sharing economy and the opportunities. Many people think of the sharing economy really obviously as being something like an Uber or an Airbnb where you're matching demand and supply and you've effectively got a platform that allows you to do that. Just imagine a scenario then where you're effectively matching the demand of uh, pet owners that they want someone to walk their dogs or uh, dog sit for them with the supply of people who don't have pets but would like to enjoy some time with an animal. And I think sharing uh, services for pets is another area really to monitor. So what factors could undermine the future growth of the pet economy? It's a really good question and um, in terms of thinking about what factors could undermine the growth of the pet economy, I'd probably call out a few things. Uh, but the first, and, and this is a question that regularly gets put to us or uh, certainly we've read about quite a lot in the literature, is think about what happens if you have a pandemic like we just had uh, if you go back to the credit crisis, people lose their jobs, they're concerned about their income. Uh, the, the concern perhaps is might they uh, forego expenditure on their pets, might they give their pets up and, uh, and turn them over to a charity or something of that nature. Uh, and I think the good news for all listeners is that actually um, pet ownership is one of the last things, at least statistically and at least historically, that pet owners actually forego. 
And when you look at surveys, we cited one of the surveys in the, uh, in the work we've produced that goes alongside this video, and a very, very significant majority of owners said that we would rather give up dining out or takeaway meals, even video subscriptions, uh, in preference to uh, foregoing expenditure on our pet. So I think that that charge can be countered. A couple of other interesting observations. Number one, um, it's exciting to talk about um, treats, whether it's um, a pet staying at a hotel, doing dog yoga, for example. There's even Paul Secco uh, for, for animal-related celebrations. But I think it's really important, and many uh, uh, pet healthcare organizations would say this, is just because it sounds fun, not all treats work for all animals. And then finally, when you're thinking about that relationship between a pet and a doctor or a vet, and ultimately it's about the pet's health that matters, um, we have to be very careful about how tele-vet services evolve the regulation and certainly in a market like the US, which is the biggest for these services, an existing vet-pet uh, relationship needs to be in place. There has to have been that pre-existing physical dynamic before you're allowed to take it online. In what ways can investors participate in trends in the pet economy? We think that the investment opportunity in the pet economy is very attractive, it's very compelling, and it's something certainly that will merit uh, doing the work on. As we talked about earlier on, we think that the headline attractions would be as follows, that this is a market growing significantly above GDP. It's got predictable revenue streams given animals' life expectancy. Uh, it isn't affected by seasonality. Uh, you'll still be spending money on your pet, whether it's summer or winter. And also, when you think about the margin potential from digitalizing, from premiumizing, that's very, that's very compelling. And then think about the general trend towards business models around subscription services. If you're paying every month to have pet food delivered, to have um, the right to a tele-vet service, those recurring revenue streams tend to be uh, attractive and certainly something that, that it's, worth, um, it's worth looking at the investment case around. Then we go down to the next level and you look at the investment landscape. And the good news is that there are actually quite a large number of listed companies, not just in the US, which is the world's biggest market for, uh, for the pet economy, but also a small handful in Europe and an emerging number in China. And they really play across the whole spectrum from those um, uh, sort of more well-known consumer facing names that are effectively just online marketplaces for buying, for buying um, pet products to what to our mind is potentially a more interesting or attractive segment of the market which is really the B2B business to business provision. And whether that's um, pet supplies, uh, whether that's pet medicines, whether that's actually offering the software for, um, for, tele, for tele vet services, we think those are the areas that will potentially uh, merit doing further work. But really given the long tail and pardon the pun, the, the large opportunity uh, that, that lies within the pet economy, we would certainly expect to see more and more businesses coming to market. Thank you everyone for, uh, for listening to this uh, broadcast about the pet economy. Uh, I would encourage uh, all listeners to, uh, to take a read of the accompanying work. And if there are any questions, please reach out to us at Hepticon Capital. Thank you very much.